Church, it's great to see all of you here. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to find Proverbs 23. Uh, Proverbs 23. Uh, this week, uh, I did want to let you guys know if you're not aware of this, on our Church Center app, there is a way for you to take notes on the Sunday morning messages. It actually has an outline of the message. So if you're like a glutton for punishment and you want to like see how much more I have before, you know, our servant, you, you can do that. But you can also find that on the Brooks website at thebrook.net. Just uh, at the top of the page will be this Sunday and it'll have all the notes if you'd like to take notes on the messages. I feel like a lot of people just don't know that that's available. But this week I had the uh, both the privilege and the 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 responsibility and the and the. Uh, opportunity to visit with a, an elderly lady that I've known for many years, for about 15 years. She's 92 years old and has kind of entered a season of her life where the doctors have said she's in uh, maybe some final moments of her life. And so she called me up and, and uh, said, I'd, I'd like to, for you to come see me if you can. And so I did. I went and visited her uh, this week and just spent some time with her. She's a dear lady, just a wonderful Christian woman. And in the course of that conversation, we talked a little bit about family and how her children are doing. doing. And um, she talked about her son. And it, as she talked about raising her child, she said there was a season of, of his life in his teens and kind of in his early 20s where he just absolutely did not want to attend church. And that, that resonated with me a little bit. When I was growing up, I, was, I grew up in a pastor's home, and so we went to church a lot, a lot more than I wanted to go. And so it kind of resonated with me as she shared the story. But then he got into adulthood, and that uh, same kind of, you know, attitude toward the church persisted. And so for years, she prayed for her son, and she was worried about her son and where uh, he might go. And I knew that. She was a member of the church where I had pastored uh, for, for uh, about 12 years, and so I, I knew her, and, and we were talking a little bit about her son, and she said, but I have to tell you some good news. He has met a wonderful woman who is a follower of Jesus, and she is committed to Christ. And she said, my son, when he met her, uh, fell in love with her, but fell in love with Jesus. And they began attending church together. Now he serves as a youth volunteer. They don't have kids in the youth department, but he serves, and they're faithful and as she began to share that story, you could feel the joy in her heart beginning to swell. Like, as she was entering the final stage, as she's entering the final stages of her life, that was one of her concerns, was the welfare of her children, and especially her son. And you could feel the joy that she was experiencing because she saw in her son a desire to follow God's path for his life. Over the last few weeks in our uh, series on wisdom for the book of Proverbs, we focused on parenting. And today's message is not going to be a parenting message. There will certainly be some application. I will make a few points related to parents. But today's message is really for everyone. But we're going to begin today where we ended last week in, in our message on parenting. I want us to look in Proverbs 23. And before we get into the Word of God, I ask you to just pause with me and, and pray. And let's ask God for wisdom. And, and what I want to do... Many times when, when the pastor says we're going to pray in church, that means that I'm going to pray and you're going to listen to the prayer. That's typically the, the rhythm, but I want to change that a little bit today. I want us to have a time of prayer, and I'm going to remain silent, and I'm going to ask you today to spend a moment praying to God, and you talk to God and ask Him for the wisdom that you need in your own life, and then I'll lead us in prayer together. So just pause for a moment of prayer and ask God for wisdom. Father, we pray for wisdom today, that your word would speak to our hearts the things that we need to hear, challenge us where our thinking is wrong and where our thinking needs to be changed, and encourage us, God, for the journey ahead. Help us to choose our friends and companions wisely for the journey. For those who are parents in the room, I pray that today's message might speak some truth into their lives as we try to guide the hearts of our children. And for those who are making choices about companions for their journey, I pray that you might give us all wisdom today, and we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look in Proverbs 23, and beginning in verse 15. We're going to hear this kind of parental tone again as Solomon is talking to his son. He's, he writes, My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. 
My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. Here's the key verse for today. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. In verses 15 through 17, we find again that the heart is what Solomon and wisdom is really aiming at. Notice in verse 15, he says, if your heart is wise, as parents, let me just tell you, this is the end game for us as parents. What we want to do is raise children who have hearts of wisdom, hearts who follow after Jesus. But every believer, parent or not, this is the end game for us. We hear God saying to us that his desire for us is that our hearts would be wise, that we would follow God's path in our lives. And this is where wisdom begins. It begins in our hearts. The second thing we find in those verses, he says, my heart will be glad. And that word glad means to brighten up or rejoice. And this is what I sensed when I was speaking with my friend Martha this week. As she was talking about her son who's found the Lord and found the way and is following him, you could feel the joy and excitement. You could hear her heart being made glad because of what she saw in her son. And then he says in verse 16, my, when your lips speak what is right, my inmost being will exult. That word exult, it means to jump for joy. So verses 15 and 16 are positive. My son, when your heart's wise, I'll be glad. When your lips speak truth, then I'm going to jump for joy. But in verse 17, a third party enters the picture. As parents, this third party will enter the picture in our kids' lives. For every person here, young or old, there will be companions who will join us on the journey from time to time in our lives. And in verse 17, Solomon has a word for his son to protect his heart. So I want us to read verse 17 again. And in that verse, you're going to find two words of ad admonition. He's going to tell his son what not to do, but then he's going to tell him what he should do. And each of those admonitions or phrases define the other. So let's look again at verse 17. Here's the admonition of what not to do. Let not your heart envy sinners. But here's the positive, what we should do. But continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. That word envy there in verse 17 is the word jealousy. And the word sinners that you find there in that verse is actually the same word sinners that we studied earlier in this series in Proverbs 1.10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent or do not go with them. Do not join them on the journey. Do not go along with them. And that word sinner is actually a Hebrew word that would sometimes be used to describe criminals. And so he tells them in verse 17 of Proverbs 23, do not envy those sinners. In our message earlier in this series, when we studied Proverbs 1, I made this point. I want to just share it again. Before you choose a path, you should consider who's inviting you. Who's inviting you down this path? Who's wanting you to join on the journey with them? Who's wanting you to step away from where you are and go along with them? That same heart is present in Proverbs 23 and verse 17 when Solomon says, Do not let your heart envy sinners. For every parent in the room, I just want to share this with you as a parent of, I have a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old, 13, and 12. So this year, when my daughter turns 13, we're going to have four teenagers in our house. Pray for us. And I mean daily, moment by moment, intercede, build a hedge of prayer around our home. But there will come a time in your life when your voice as a parent becomes annoying. And all of a sudden, there's a voice of someone else speaking into the lives of your kids. And unfortunately, in, in our world today, most of the time, it's sinners. In fact, all of the time it is. Because all have sinned. But when he talks about sinners here, he's not talking about the, the general equation that all men are sinners. He's speaking specifically about those who have chosen a path that is contrary to God and his word. Now, this phenomenon among parents used to happen when, teenager, when kids became teenagers. And all of a sudden, the eye rolls start, right? The sighs and the attitude begin. 
But in our culture, I think it's, become, it's coming earlier and earlier for our children. And I think there's a reason for it. So I want to speak just a kind of parenthetical moment here for the parents. I want you to look at verse 17, the first phrase again. Let not your heart envy sinners. In our culture today, where have we created a space where you can look on the lives of other people and envy them? What is it? Social media. You know it's true. Because as adults, we struggle with it. But with our young people, they struggle with it immensely. I want to share a few things with you as parents here about this, this environment. There's a group called Regroup, the Regroup Foundation. They're an organization that helps parents and teens struggling with mental health issues. I want to read a quote from one of their studies. It'll be on the screen. Hours spent navigating through curated feeds full of heavily produced images and videos, many posted by influencers who themselves spend virtually every waking moment creating content, can lead to feelings of jealousy, inadequacy, and a distorted sense of reality. This can lead to or exacerbate depression and anxiety, body dysmorphia, and eating disorders, particularly among girls. The very design of these platforms can foster addictive behaviors, disrupt sleep patterns, and erode self-esteem, thereby contributing to a decline in overall mental well-being. As a result, studies indicate that feelings of loneliness and anxiety among teens are skyrocketing. Now I want you to imagine yourself, it's the beginning of the school year, that your school calls a meeting together of parents and they tell you about this new club. That they're starting this new club and they tell you, listen, if, you're, if your kid gets in this club, then it's going to lead to some eating disorders, it's going to lead to depression and anxiety, and in some cases can lead to bullying that would lead to suicide. On that night, how many people do you think, how many parents would sign their kids up for that club? But parents, when we allow our children on these social media platform sites, without watching them, without guarding them, we are signing them up for that very club. We're signing them up for a place where they can look on the lives of sinners and envy them. Parents, you need to understand that you are the guardians of your children's hearts. Notice in verse, 20, uh, verse 17 again that Proverbs 23 and verse 17 is about choices. Notice at the beginning he says, let not. That means do not give permission or do not allow your heart to envy sinners. What happens in your heart is your choice. But you must guard your heart from envy. Write this just nugget down. What controls your heart controls you we talked about this last week so i won't you know go over it again but proverbs 4 has an amazing verse guard your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life in other words whatever's in your heart whatever controls your heart is what controls your lives and what's so problematic with social media especially among young people is that it controls their hearts and therefore it controls their lives there are disorders that have been created by social media because young people are addicted to the affirmations that they receive when someone likes their post or when someone makes a good comment toward them. So parents, I want you to know that it's your job to be the gatekeeper of your kids' hearts. You see, because when the time comes that your children begin to bring along companions for their journey, whether that's friends that they take into adulthood their friends during their teenage years, or maybe a girlfriend or boyfriend that they date, or maybe even a spouse that they would consider, they need wisdom in their hearts, and they need to choose those companions wisely. Notice in verse 17, do not let your heart envy sinners. That's one admonition, and that's what not to do. But here's the admonition in verse 17 of what we should do. Continue in the fear of the Lord all the day notice first of all in that verse that the word lord is in all capitals that's yahweh it is the most revered name of god it is the unspeakable name of god the hebrew writers had such a respect for the name of god that they would not write his name in its entirety because they feared that they might spell it wrong or they might have one little jot 
from their pen that might uh, cause any kind of dishonor to the name of God. And so they would write it in this way, and the translators kept it in all caps. So he's talking about the Lord Jehovah God. He says to continue in the fear of Jehovah. Now that word continue is important. In fact, I'm going to show you a different translation of this verse that I think will actually help kind of give you understanding of what that word continue means. If you go to that next one, it says, Do not let your heart envy sinners. But listen to this. But be in the fear of Jehovah all the day long. You see this? Be in the fear of the Lord is the word that's translated in the ESV as continue. Other translations simply say to be in the fear of the Lord. That word continue, it simply means to remain or to be in one place. In other words, as you go along your journey, do not be envious of sinners, but let your life be in a constant state of fear and reverence of Jehovah God. Simply be in the fear of the Lord. And notice the way verse 17 ends. It's the phrase all the day, every moment. At school for you young people, at work, at baseball practice, at the soccer field, at the coffee shop, with the family, with your neighbors, out on a date. Be in the fear of the Lord all the day. But I want to talk about that phrase for just a moment. And I'm probably going to preach a little bit here, so you just have to bear with me on this. The fear of the Lord is something that the culture has lost. And I just want to make this statement. I think the church has lost. The fear of the Lord. If you've ever had the opportunity to go to SeaWorld, I think this story is going to make sense to you. You go see the Shamu show, and please stop with the Blackfish movie. I saw it, okay? I still like the fish jumping, all right? Whatever. Or if it's not a fish, whatever it is. I, I get it. I don't want to offend anybody by sharing a SeaWorld story. But I want to make this point. You go see Shamu. This incredible animal comes up out of that water. And it is so massive, it's hard to really understand how big it is. And to see these animals do what they do is fascinating. And if you've ever been there, you can walk up to the side of the tank and it's glass and the, the kids will be there and sometimes Shamu will come by and, and then, you know, kind of do the, the fin in the water, the tail in the water and splash all the kids and they get all excited about the salt water all over them. It's disgusting if you ask me, but whatever. There's a debate about whether the great white shark or... Um, the killer whales are the most feared predator in the sea. They're known for, for hunting in pods. If you've seen the video, you can go on YouTube and look it up. Just type in killer whale, baby seal, iceberg. It's terrifying. <laughs> this sea, this uh, sea lion is, is on this uh, piece of ice, and these killer whales come up around it, and they begin to splash the water and create waves to wash that poor sea lion into the water, not so that they can, like, play with it, but so that then they can throw it around. It's awful. A, sea, uh, excuse me, a killer whale's bite has a bite force of 19,000 PSI. To give you some perspective, the average human bite force is 160 PSI. You ever been bitten by somebody when you were a kid? It hurts. A killer whale will bite with 118 times more force than a human being. You know how many PSI it takes to crush a car? 2,500. They bite with 19,000. These are ferocious animals. You go see the show, it's fascinating to see. And then as you walk out of SeaWorld, they have it strategically planned for you to exit the park, not through the gate you came in through, but where? Through the gift shop. And guess what they have there on the shelves? Hundreds and hundreds of plush toy killer whales. But they're so cute. You don't see any plush toys with a killer whale with blood dripping down its mouth? With a little sea lion, little bobblehead? No. Because that doesn't sell. And they know better. So this killer whale is like just sitting there and they're smiling. And here's the problem. I think in our culture today, in an effort to make God and his word more palatable, the church has reduced God down to a plush toy version of who he is. And in doing so, we are condemning people to hell by the millions. He says in that verse, 
to continue in the fear of the Lord. I want you to pause here in, in Proverbs 23. Hold your spot. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to read what I hope to be an awe-inspiring chapter and passage in Scripture. You've heard this reference probably before, but this is a reference to the return of Jesus, and it's going to be Jesus on this horse. And I want to just simply read it and let you receive the revelation from God and His Word that John received on the Isle of Patmos as he received the revelation from God about the end of the world and the end of all things. Notice in not Revelation 19 and verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on him is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. And he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their names, get armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is not the picture of Jesus that is preached often enough. We want a Jesus who is the friend of sinners. We want the Jesus that I heard described on a radio station one morning when I was in college. I was driving to school at HBU. And I heard the, the person on the radio, and I know they intended well, said, whatever you have, just crawl up into the lap of Daddy God. And I understand they want to see God as a loving father, and he is a loving father, and he is Abba Father, and we receive adoption as sons. But when Isaiah came into the presence of God in Isaiah 6, where the angels go around the throne of God and they cease not day and night to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. His response was not, God, let me get up on your lap. His response was, Woe is me. I am undone. I am filthy and I am unclean and I am not worthy. And when God said, who will I send for us? His only response was, just send me, God. That's fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord is to shudder in his presence. A fear of the Lord is to have a proper reverence for God. God is infinitely loving, but God is infinitely holy. He is infinitely forgiving but he is infinitely just. The same God has all of these qualities in himself. A few weeks ago at a Friday night football game, the opposing band began to play a song, like one of their songs, you know, for the football team. And they played the same song. It's about a 45-second song. They played it for 10 straight minutes. I mean, it was amazing. It was awesome. But at a certain point, you're like, all right, We'll play something else. Your team's losing. It ain't working, all right? <laughs> and they just kept playing it over and over again. It would get this one part of the song, get real quiet, and then it would build back up, and the band would sing, and, and the cheerleaders were doing their dance. I mean, it was just over and over again. And at a certain point, it got annoying. But then when it stopped, it sounded so quiet in the field. Imagine the throne room of God 
where these angels do not ever cease saying the same phrase over and 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 over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they cease not day and night. And every time they say it, they meant it as if it was the first time they were saying it because of the holiness in the presence of God. When Solomon says to continue in the fear of the Lord, it's that reverence and that awe of God that his presence should inspire in our lives so that when we have the two paths, a choice against God and a choice to follow uh, the ways of the world, it is so obvious that our fear of God would lead us to choose the paths of righteousness all the day. You see it? Continue in the fear of the Lord. The fear of God causes the heart to tremble. And it causes your will to bend to the will of this holy God. My friends, if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, then the scene that I just read to you from Revelation chapter 19 ought to cause your heart to tremble in fear of the Lord. There is no salvation except in the rider on that horse. He is the unmatched creator of this universe. There is no one like him. There was no one before him. There won't be anyone that will outlive him. Live him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jehovah God of, of uh, Proverbs 23 is the same. Jesus on that horse, they are the same. And he is the way of salvation. But he is infinitely gracious. He's infinitely loving. And the cross tells you that in a resounding voice for the ages that God demonstrated his love for you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us he made a way for us to be right with god and if you've never received that then today needs to be the day of your salvation and then from that moment continue in the fear of the lord all the days of your life because in proverbs 23 we learn a lot about the fear of the lord these verses will be on the screen they're in the notes online he says continue in the fear of the lord all the day in proverbs 23 and verse 7 proverbs 1 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 2 and verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Proverbs 16 and verse 6, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Listen, a reverence and a fear of God is the companion that we have to take on our journey. And it, it affects every choice that we make in life. The fear of the Lord is where knowledge begins. It's where knowledge is found. It's where wisdom and insight begin. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. The fear of the Lord gives strong confidence. It's a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord turns us away from evil. And so he says in verse 17 again, don't envy sinners. Don't envy them. There's only one who's glorious. There's only one who is to be sought. And it's not your fellow sinners. It's the Lord. And he's to be feared all the day. Notice he continues in verse 18. As he talks about this choosing in our lives. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Hear my son and be wise. And direct your heart in the way. Continuing in the fear of the Lord leads to safety and to joy. Did you hear it in those verses? Continue in that way. And notice in verse 20, when we reject the fear of the Lord, we become a companion of fools. Solomon writes, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and the slumber will clothe them with rags. If you look down in verses 29 through 35, he's going to lay out in great detail what this life is about and the benefits of drunkenness. Here are the benefits. 
woe, sorrow, strife. It bites like a serpent. It stings like an adder. And they say strange and perverse things. When he says in verse 17, don't envy the way of sinners, why in the world would that way be something that we would look for? Look for hurt and trouble and sorrow. But if we remain in the fear of the Lord, it makes that path deplorable for us. We see how short-sighted it is and how short-lived the blessings or benefits of that path look like. He continues, look down to verse 27. For a prostitute is a deep pit, an adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. He talks about companions who are sexually immoral on the journey. He's describing them. Don't envy this path, but choose instead the fear of the Lord. Turn over to Proverbs, the next chapter, 24, verse 1. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts devise violence, and their lips talk of trouble. I'm going to stop there today. And we're going to pick up here next week. And next week when it's Family Sunday with our students in here, we're going to talk about wisdom for how we choose our companions on the journey of life. But I'll ask the worship team to come, and I'm just going to read verse 17. And as I read it, I want you to let God and His Word speak to your heart. Let not your heart envy sinners. But continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Will you stand with me today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? As we study through the book of Proverbs and these words of wisdom, we've seen over and over again that there are two paths. The path of God's wisdom, which is a path of salvation and protection, a path that leads to life. And then there's the path of the fool. It's a path that leads to death. It's a path that leads us to destruction. And just standing there today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to talk to two groups of people. The first one is maybe for someone in the room who has never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus is both the loving Savior on the cross and he is the King of kings and Lord of lords on that white horse that we read. And today, if you've never placed your faith in Christ as Savior, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's not about coming forward and saying a prayer. It's not coming forward and being a part of some religious act. It's right where you're standing, right now, in your heart, coming to that king and saying to him, you are my savior. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I follow the paths of folly. And today I come to you as the king of kings and Lord of lords. And I believe that Jesus died for me and he paid the price for my sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day to pay for my sins. Right where you're standing today. If that's you, if you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, would you simply raise your hand for a moment so I can pray for you? Anybody at all in this room today? Thank you. Yes, keep it up just for a moment. Thank you. With your hand raised, just crying out to the Lord. God, I recognize my sin and that Jesus is the Savior. And right there where you're standing with your hand raised, give your heart to Jesus. And the Bible says that when we believe in Jesus as our Savior, when we place our faith and confidence in Him as the King, He will save us and forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. And are there others of you today who would just say, Robbie, I, I've been listening to this series on Proverbs and there are just, there's some areas of my life where I'm just not following God's path. And I found myself envying sinners. I found myself choosing wrong companions. I found myself on this wrong path in this part of my life. That's me today. Will you pray for me? If that's you, would you just raise your hand with me on that? And I'm saying with me. Thank you. Keep them up just for a moment. Keep them up. Thank you. Let me pray for you. Father, with our hands lifted today, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Help us to live out this truth today. To not envy sinners but to continue in the fear of our God 
all the day. And help us to choose the paths that lead to life. To step off the path that we're on today to a new one. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.